Welcome to episode 12 of the Various and Sundry podcast. I am your host, Matt Harmon, joined in studio, as always, by my good friend and maker of outstanding homemade pretzels. That's right. John Sloat. That's right. All right, let's get some honest feedback on the pretzels. What did you think of them over the weekend? I thought the pretzels were excellent. They had a, a good a, a good flavor. Mm. I think they had the the right amount of salt, which is an important piece of that. You know, they're just striking that oh, balance yeah. of salt. They were they were quite tasty. So you, your skills have branched out beyond just smoker of meats yeah. and other things to maker of 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 fine homemade pretzels. Yeah, we're uh, we're gonna try smoking the pretzels next. I think that's I think that's next level. <laughs> okay, yes, worlds colliding there. Yes, yeah, yeah, in, so, in an exciting way. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, as always, we encourage uh, interaction with our listeners, and so you can reach out to us on Twitter. You can find us at V and S Pod. And you can also email the show, various and sundry podcast at gmail.com. And we certainly want to encourage you to uh, go ahead and leave a review. And of course, a five star rating is always greatly appreciated, especially at, in this period of time where we. Are uh, many people are looking for additional content in their lives? Uh, getting those five star ratings can be especially helpful in whatever algorithms the services use to recommend podcasts. So uh, please go ahead and uh, do that. We would would welcome your critical feedback. Uh, just give it to us by the email, right? Or yeah, on Twitter. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Either of those ways are fine. Just not on Apple yeah. or wherever you're reviewing podcasts. Yeah. We just want five star reviews there. Yeah. So here we are. We're recording on what is today, March twenty fourth. Today the twenty fourth. Uh, yeah. My goodness. Which, uh, just as a sort of public service announcement to our listeners, is the last day before the. Uh, State of Indiana has uh, will begin to enforce a shelter in place, whatever that means. Yeah, yeah. Isn't it funny how all of a sudden, within these last two weeks, a whole new set of vocabulary has has come to us in light of the coronavirus crisis? Yeah, I, here's something I don't understand: social distancing. Yeah, is a new word that is that has really come up in the last two weeks in my life, and yeah. I've been saying it all the time. Isn't it really physical distancing that we that we're really looking for? I need to be physically six feet apart from you. Socially, we can interact, we can talk, we can we can have conversation, but really, we need to be physically separated. Does does that make sense? Yeah, though I think that part of what's trying to be captured there uh, with with that term is also the um, just the reality of your limiting your social interactions, mm. right? That, yeah, that you, I that, think that's that, true. That even before yeah. this sort of shelter-in-place order goes into effect, it was supposed to be, yeah, you're limiting the number of people and the uh, number of times you're engaging in social interaction in a physical form. Yeah, yeah. So, but that's that's one thing where I'm going social distancing. I don't I don't need I need physical distancing, which I I, I hear what they're saying. Social gatherings, right? They're trying right. to limit those things. But, yeah, but so. Uh, today, we should be, if things were actually in some semblance of normalcy, we if would be the ta- world were right. Yes, we would be talking about the Sweet 16, that we should be at the point now where the NCAA tournament had completed its first four days. The, we, we should be breaking down our brackets. Yeah, and uh, oh. so March sadness is definitely in effect here. Um, and it was just announced this morning that the Summer Olympics in Tokyo have been postponed. To at least, uh, well, I think they, what they put it is no later than twenty summer of 2021. That, yeah, that's that, what they're hoping. That, yeah, my understanding that, is one year. Yeah. Yeah. Which, more or less in terms of sports, leaves you with NFL free agency, which is not the most riveting of uh, topics for, I mean, that that's kind of deep dive even for the, the sort of normal sports fan, right? Right. Unless you get really nerdy about contracts and years and guaranteed dollars, then... Uh, or if it particularly affects your team. If it particularly affects your team. Right. Yeah. So if you're a fan of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, you're talking about this nonstop because... Which apparently exists. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, you should know this. Your parents. My live parents are in the area. like yeah. like five minutes from the stadium. Yeah, like, so they're right around the corner. I imagine there's quite a bit of buzz about Tom Brady signing with the Buccaneers. Yeah, I understand Brady's uh, jersey sales are up nine hundred percent right course. now. Yeah, of course. And of course, uh, you know, we, we are not going to go deep dive on that. Uh, we just don't think that that probably serves our listeners no. well, and quite frankly, neither of us are really that invested in that. Now, I suppose if the Jets had made a big splash in free agency, we'd be talking, we'd about, be it. talking about yeah. it. Yeah. But I don't have a professional football team that I closely follow. Though, on the college front, Ohio State picked up a, uh, a graduate transfer running back from Oklahoma, who's going to be a nice. fantastic addition to the football team for next okay. year, assuming that we have a football season in the fall. But... Those are those are sad thoughts for another day, perhaps. Right? Yeah, yeah. I'm not ready to give up football yet. <laughs> well, I'm not either. I, I'm just I'm just saying that. Who knows? I mean, two weeks ago we would have never thought. Yeah, they're going to shut down March Madness and and postpone the NBA season for two months, three months, whatever it's going to end yeah, up being. The the quote unquote hiatus. You yeah. Know, you know. Yeah, the, absolutely. Yeah. But. Let's get to our main topic for the day, right? Is there anything else you want to cover on the sports front before we actually dive into um, our I main just had topic? A, maybe a question. How much do you enjoy the Olympics? Are you are you a bit I don't I don't know that we've ever talked about it. Are you a big Olympic watcher when it's on? Do you watch? I think I'm probably pretty ordinary in that. Like there are certain Olympic events that I enjoy watching and there is a, a sense of um sort of national pride that kicks in of like wanting the usa to do well Mm -hmm. in certain things and you know i I think with with the summer olympics there are there's more things for me that i'm more naturally interested in than the winter olympics though with the winter olympics you have the sort of the fascination with curling for example like that's really odd and unique and different so you're kind of captivated by the uniqueness of there's this object that looks like a like a hockey puck on steroids, yeah. With men and women around it with brooms on ice, yeah. It's beautiful, it's just, isn't it? It's so bizarre and yet so captivating in terms of mm-hmm. once every four years. It's like I can't take my eyes off that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't have that really with anything in the Summer Olympics. I mean, I enjoy some of the track and field events. Um, obviously, there's basketball. I enjoy the swimming, yeah, watching watching the guys race. I, I love a good race when it's quick like that, yeah. like, like in swimming. Yeah. Cross-country skiing, not so much. That's not hard so to much. watch. And I do, I do enjoy watching greatness. So even though I'm not drawn to swimming, like watching Michael Phelps over the f- past few Olympics— That's a lot of fun. —has been fantastic. Like y- you're watching a, an, an elite level of greatness that you think— this is unprecedented. Yeah. Here, here's here's the Tiger Woods of swimming right here. And so I'm attracted to watching greatness in that sense. And it doesn't even just have to be, um, you know, a sport that I am particularly drawn to. If I see a level of historic greatness, you have my interest, at least initially, to see, wow, someone's doing something that's never been done before. I'm interested. Yeah. Sorry, but wanted to hear your take yeah. on the on the Olympics and how much you enjoy them. Yeah, what about you, Any? I mean, oh, I I love the Olympics. I have great memories as a child, like s- sitting in front of the TV each night watching the Olympics and watching watching the replays when it was over uh, on the other side of the world. Um, and then I also remember my parents trying to get me to go to bed and just like, no, but this guy's going to wrestle at this time, <laughs> and uh, yeah. and my parents being frustrated with me because I was saying those things. They go. It's taped. He won. Go to bed. <laughs> oh, no. So, Spoiler alert. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, now with the advent of streaming and things like that, tape delay has, has fallen on harder times with the networks, right? Like, oh, yeah. You know, if you really want to know, you can, you know, get up at 3 a.m. and watch it live streamed. Or because of the ubiquity of information, it's hard to cr- to sh- shut yourself off from knowing who won, who wins the race that you're interested in. Like, it's just really hard to Dur- avoid that. During the last Winter Olympics, I got uh, pretty, pretty sick. And so I was in my apartment. I didn't have any windows in my living room. And so I would just sleep as long as I wanted. And then I would wake up and I would watch the Olympics that were going on. 
And I think I reverse cycled myself where I was sleeping during the day and watching curling all night. And, and, and it just sort of, just sort of lost all sense of time. Um, and it was, uh, it was, a, it was uh, other than being sick, it was a yeah. good time. Okay. Gotcha. Well, uh, you know, who knows what's going to develop in the future, but if we need sports content, maybe we'll go down to uh, breaking down past curling uh, championships at, yeah. at some point here. Or I, axe throwing on ESPN, <laughs> the Ocho. Or... Yeah. Did you see, they, you saw that they've... I saw that they did that, yeah. Man, that shows how desperate places like ESPN are. But, you know, I, I CBS finally did this past Sunday re-air some some championship games from the NCAA yeah, tournament. Yeah, I watched, that, I watched the 92 Duke-University uh, of Kentucky game. It was quite... Yeah, quite the regional good. final. That, yeah. was, that was entertaining. So, Well, our, our main topic for today is um, we're going to talk about the, the death of expertise. And um, this has been something that we have talked about a little bit, even in advance of the current coronavirus crisis. Sure. Uh, so this is not... Uh, we don't want this to be perceived just as related to that. We, we will inevitably talk about how this idea of death of expertise plays into our understanding of what's going on currently with the coronavirus. But it's we want our discussion to be much broader than that when it comes to this whole area. And so I think that the this sort of activating event for us thinking we should really talk about this on the pod— was um, an article that uh, that we came across by Alan Jacobs that's entitled "Who You Gonna Believe?" Yeah, good title. It's a great title. Yeah, yeah. And so, basically, um, it it enters into the conversation of how we as a culture perceive experts and what we do with what is presented as expert information or expert uh, analysis of, of something. Mm-hmm. And so um, I don't know if we want to dive into uh, to, to that specific article, though uh, in some ways he is basing, not necessarily basing, but he is building on, that's probably the better way to put it, uh, a book that was written by Tom Nichols that's actually entitled the Death of Expertise, The Campaign Against Established Knowledge and Why It Matters. And that was published in 2017. And have you have you heard of this book or read this book? I think I had only heard of it vaguely. So I actually downloaded the um, the audiobook yesterday. Oh, did you? Okay. And listened to the preface in the first chapter. And so uh, I'm enjoying it, and uh, I think it's proving very helpful. I'm trying to remember, I think... If I remember correctly, Tom Nichols is the um, is a foreign policy analyst, hmm. and so part of what he's talking about comes out of that realm of um, his experience in in discussions of foreign policy and what should be done and, and those sorts of things. And so, uh, but it's much broader than that. He he's much more interested in just broadly speaking, um, why is it that it seems like in our contemporary culture that more and more people consistently are distrusting experts or dismissing experts and their um, and what they put forward in terms of a certain subject. So, why do you think that is? What, what in your experience? Oh my goodness! Uh, I, I think there's a number. Of, there's uh, in in the article he kind of lays out several mm-hmm. options for yeah. like why would people do this. Um, and he kind of lands on, it's probably a combination of all of them. Sure. Um, and I, I, I think that's right. I don't think there's a, there's a magic bullet here as to why people, people do this. But one, one factor that he, did, that he didn't bring up um, that I'm kind of forming in my head right now, so roll with me, uh, <laughs> is, uh, you, you know, in a, in, a, in a former generation, in a former place in our world, I, I think... Uh, there was an understanding that there was uh, some set of an objective truth that was out there, mm-hmm. and uh, we were trying to uh, interact with it, report on it, uh, uh, be an expert about it. Um, however, with the um, with the rise of um, truth is found within myself, and 
uh, that that leads us, I think, to a pretty dangerous place that maybe we haven't talked about much as a society where truth is something that is informed by my bias, and because I have my bias, therefore my bias is truth. Mm-hmm. And it comes out that way. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. Do, do you think that plays into this? Uh, this why, do, uh, why, why have we stopped trusting experts? Yeah, I think so. I think that, um, you know, when you consider the emphasis that our culture often has on things, uh, sayings like, you just do you. Mm-hmm. You just define, you create your own identity. You create your own uh, possibilities. Yeah. You are the, in one sense, you are the center of the universe. Mm-hmm. Whatever you want, you can make happen. And um, if that's the case, then of course it has spillover effects into um, our consumption of expert expertise, expert knowledge, and things like that. That um, that if you don't like what an expert says, you feel the freedom to say, well, I'm going to make my own reality. I, I don't like that. That doesn't line up with my preferences, my biases. And so I'm just going to make my own reality. I, if I just... Uh, ignore that or can dismiss what they say, then, yeah. So I think there's absolutely the the loss of a a sense of absolute truth, mm-hmm. that there are things that are objectively absolutely true, that no amount of wishing them not to be changes mm-hmm. them. Certainly plays into that, absolutely. Yeah. Well, as you read the article, what were you what were you thinking? Why, as you were reflecting on this, why mm-hmm. has uh, why has expertise fallen on hard times? Yeah. Actually, I think um, for me, what what st- what stands out is um, I think that part of why people uh, distrust experts uh, and these some of these these are drawn from the article and my own experience as well, but. I think the first thing is that um, oftentimes experts disagree. Yeah. That you can have someone who might be an absolute expert in a field who mm-hmm. clearly has the credentials, has the life experience, has all those sorts of things. And they will say, this is, this is what's true and this is um, what you should know. And then another expert comes along and says, no, it's not. No, it's not. And they have comparable uh, credentials and life experience. And they say, so then you have these competing experts that then the person who's not an expert is, is left with, well, what am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> Who am I supposed to believe? <laughs> what am I supposed to do with that? Yeah. So I think that the fact that there are often cases where experts just flat out disagree on something that leaves the consumer with a sense of, I don't know what to do with that. And so the the response is just to dismiss it or to pick the one that most clearly aligns yeah. with your own pre-existing biases and assumptions. Right. That's confirmation bias, reinforcing your own bias uh, right. by listening to experts that agree with you and, and only those experts. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that sort of stepping aside for a minute, out, outside the public policy realm— um, you know, I think that I, I I see this in my own field of biblical studies and that sort of thing, where you have people who have the same kind of credentials, perhaps even better credentials than I do. You know, I have a PhD in biblical theology and New Testament studies. Like, I, I have the credentials. I have a, you know, I have 13, almost going on now, 14 years of experience teaching in the classroom, of reading the literature, of publishing in the field, all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And there are plenty of experts who have similar credentials who would disagree with things that I would say in terms of even just basic things like um, the reliability of the the New Testament, the historical reliability of of the Bible. We would disagree. Sure. And that expert could marshal evidence that they think disproves it, and I would marshal evidence that I think proves the historical reliability of the Bible. And so even in my own field, you can see that. And then I think it's taken another step, though, into the classroom, where I, this is not pervasive, but I've, I've, I've experienced it, Yeah, where um, perhaps a, a little over-eager 
undergraduate student mm -hmm. uh, decides to challenge a view I have in class. And they give the impression that their half-baked, recently arrived at opinion on something is essentially the, of the same value as my own conclusion that's been based on years of research and study and publication interact and interaction with other experts in the field. That those that there should be no distinction in valuing yeah. those two opinions. Yeah. Now, let's be clear. I can be wrong on many things. So I'm not saying that 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 automatically means that the student is wrong and I'm right. And and that's a big part of the intellectual process, right? Yeah. As people that teach and think for a living, humility has to be has to be a part of that. We have to foster that um, in our own lives. So no, that's a that's a good word. But sorry, I interrupted. Keep going. No, I think that the but what what I'm sort of pushing back against is the the sort of arrogance that comes from wait a minute so you're just processing this for the first time and you're ready to dismiss my opinion as at some level an expert on this subject because you've had a half-baked thought after 15 minutes of reading the bible passage and talking about it with some buddies and you think that that you're ready to just cavalierly dismiss yeah the opinion of oh, yeah. scholars I've, I've seen yeah yeah, partic for some reason, also, it seems to be uh, young male Bible students that, oh, that, yeah. that <laughs> come across that. Yeah. Um, and then I think back, wait, I was a young male Bible student <laughs> at one time. How do I, <laughs> what yeah. was I like in, yeah. in the classroom? So, but I do think, um, I think that, you know, my taste of that is, is you know, one thing, but we, we want to talk more broadly, I think, about our, our larger cultural moment in terms of why is it that we uh, distrust expert opinions, expert analysis, etc. We've already talked about the fact that experts disagree. Mm -hmm. um, I think that a another piece of that is experts often speak outside of their lane, so to speak, right? Yeah. That you, you've got someone who... and this. This is the low-hanging fruit uh, example. There are more, but I think one of the most obvious ones that people recognize is that— uh, so you've got a Hollywood entertainer who is an expert in their field, right? Maybe they're a great actor or they're a great musician or something like that. Sure. And then they speak on some issue of public policy, and— they're, they expect that their opinion should be given all of this weight on this public policy issue because they're really good at acting or because they're great at performing musically or something like that, 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 that their opinion somehow has all of this weight on maybe something like climate change or whether or not the United States should have a government-run health care system, something like what does your expertise in acting have anything to do with whether or not the government should have should basically run our healthcare system? And the answer is, it has absolutely nothing to do with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're stepping outside of their lane. Exactly. Yeah, I think I think maybe one that's uh, less maybe less fun to talk about is the, is the coronavirus. Currently, we were talking about this over the weekend. Mm -hmm. That um, as you're making policy, you have health experts. Yes. who are saying one thing about, oh my goodness, we need to quarantine, we need to quarantine, we need to quarantine, we need to stop, you know, flatten the curve, all, all these things. Mm -hmm. Another uh, uh, verbiage that's come up in the last, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, um, I always thought that had to do with weight loss, you know, <laughs> but um, uh, flatten the curve. And then uh, you have economic experts that go, if we don't get back to work, if we don't get back to some sense of normalcy here in the next weeks, uh, there is going to be uh, huge ramifications. And those, those, Yes. Experts from different fields are clashing with one another currently. Yes. And then at that point, you have the responsibility of our political and government leadership to have to try to sort out yeah. weighing those things, right? Like, oh, yeah. You know, oh, it's, and so, it's... again, we are, we are not going to talk politics on, on this podcast, but we no. can all acknowledge that our government leaders— whether it's President Trump or the individual governors of each of these individual states, 
has they have an impossible task. Yeah. Because they're not experts in any of these things. And so their reliance upon health ex, uh, health experts and even then not all health experts agree on what's going to happen. Sure. Yeah. And then you've got economic experts who don't all agree on what will happen if we, you know, essentially shut down the economy for a month, six weeks, two months, whatever it might be. And I, I think that's another point that that people's expertise are not siloed, right? So, so um, health experts are going to say, "Here's one decision. Mm-hmm. It's just not going to affect public health. It's going to affect economic uh, health as well." And so, right. economic health expertise is going to have one thought and decision, and they're going to come at it from their perspective. And it's going to affect, you know, you know, these things, these decisions are not siloed. Things are impacting one another, and and it's an it's incredibly complex. And you can yes. you can tease that out into other disciplines and other yes. areas as well. It's just not coronavirus, but right. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the most pressing example that we that we're feeling right now yeah, in terms of our it's cultural right in moment. Right front of us, yeah. But um, you know, even some of the discussions of, and then you then you bring in what are what are framed as moral considerations, mm-hmm. right? Into this conversation of there's the the health experts saying, shut everything down as long as we can, quarantine, aggressive measures on that. Then you've got the the economists who are coming along and saying, um, the longer that goes, we can't even begin to fully appreciate how long it might take the economy to recover from that. And by the way, some of those economists are saying, that then also has an impact on health issues down the road of higher rates of depression, higher rates of substance abuse, higher sure. rates of alcoholism, that those are, those are still public health issues that are related to the economic piece. And then you have other people who come along and say, well, what's the moral thing to do? Which is, a right, which is the right question. It sure. is a good question. But, um, you know, I think that sometimes those 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 discussions uh don't often appreciate nuance or appreciate that that at, at the end of the day we're just making a best guess here well and <laughs> yes I, I think that's part of it we're making a best guess and and it's incredibly complex and it requires lots of conversation lots of interaction lots of reading and uh and frankly a 45 minute discussion about uh, health policy, economic policy, and moral policy isn't going to play well in a in a five minute uh, thing on CNN, yeah. you know, or or Fox News. Well, and, and and in fairness, the current situation means that we don't have months to sort this out, right? Like, you, President Trump can't say, "I don't know," and so. We're going to create a task force, and we're going to study this thing for the next three months, and then we're going to have a recommendation for for what we're going to do. We don't have time for that in this current – like some issues like – you know, just to throw one out there. Let's say uh, the healthcare system. You know, right? You you could create a a special task force to say we're going to study whether or not we think we should have a government-run healthcare system or the free market – system or some hybrid of the two. And we're going to study that for the next six months and come out with recommendations. People will be like, okay, yeah, we got time for that. Yeah. Not we, this. No, we don't. And so you got to make a decision and it's, <coughs> it's incredibly difficult and incredibly complex. But back to the original question. Yeah. Why else don't we trust experts? So we've talked about experts disagree. Um, experts speak outside their lane and, um, I think another thing is that um, the fact that, and the, this is not unique to me. I, I forget which source I, I heard this in or read this in, but but I think there's something to be said here. Of experts are often very good with facts and information, yeah, but not always the best at then. Therefore, here is the policy that should come out of that set of facts and information. So they're really good at the theory, not necessarily the implications. Is that is that kind of what you're 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 getting after? Like, like 
here's sort of this this uh, theory that I have, and therefore it needs to be employed this way. Or is that kind of what you're getting at? Well, think of, think of the realm of foreign policy. Mm-hmm. You you know, a foreign policy expert, he or she might have a terrific grasp of the of the socioeconomic dynamics in the various countries in the Middle East Mm -hmm. and might think that, you know, you know, they might know the histories of each of those countries, the, the larger economic factors that are playing into this and the social dynamics and the history and all of those things. They might have a fantastic grasp of all of those pieces of information, but then to move from that to therefore you should decide, you know, Therefore, Mr. President, this is what you should do. You should cut off economic aid to them, or you should put troops on the borders. Well, that's a, that, that jump to policy then is a different animal yeah. than being an expert in the history of the royal family in Saudi Arabia, the political dynamics in Israel, and um, the socioeconomic factors going on in Egypt and all of the other countries in the Middle East, Right. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So you could be an expert in knowing all of that information, but not necessarily an expert then in, in, in putting together a policy that produces a good outcome. Speaking of which, I would love to be an expert in the Saudi family. I would just love to be <laughs> there knowing what's going on. Those, those people are, are uh, there, there's a lot going on there, and I'd, I'd love to just know about it and yeah. see what's going on day by day. Right. I, I want to... We need to start moving uh, to a. We don't just want to be a. Well, this all stinks, and so mm-hmm. we 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 don't want to just be. Here's the problem. We we are going to suggest some ways that, I think that, each of us have tried to overcome some of this, but here's here's a piece of the puzzle that I that I want to bring up as well. Is um, the fact that uh, our current distrust of many people's distrust of the media Mm -hmm. plays into this as well because what often feels like happens is when you have media outlets that have pretty clear some of them crystal clear and others more subtle but still biases and agendas that shape how they report the news and then shapes how or which experts they bring forward to present to their consumers of, well, this is the situation and here's our expert. And lo and behold, he just happens to agree on the policy end with what we think should happen. So surprise, surprise, right? Yeah. So I think that that's another piece of it that our, 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 our system, our systemic distrust of the media when it comes to feeling like the media treats things objectively as reasonably objectively as possible and there seems to be less and less of a uh, a desire to bring in outside voices like there's in media it seems like there's a desire to bring to to have less and less diversification amongst your uh, uh if you're a newspaper writing team or if you're a, a news uh, mm-hmm. a tv show to have diverse viewpoints uh, across the political spectrum. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I think that those things certainly feed into the into the dynamic, but um let's talk solutions. Not, yeah. I mean, not that we feel like we've got it perfectly figured out by any means, but as we sort of talked about what 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 might it look like as an individual so as we're trying to say, let, let's say at this point our listeners are like, yeah, I agree with you that this is a big problem. So what do I do? Like how, how, do, I, how do I fix this? Or at least what can I do personally to make me a better thinker, a better consumer of expertise and, and that sort of stuff? Yeah, I think, I think the first step is to recognize the waters that you're swimming in, to, to understand that, oh my goodness, look where I'm at and look – what's going on around me you know be able to identify bias and to read uh, almost read past the biases Mm -hmm. is i I think being able to recognize it's a big a big piece of that Mm -hmm. um and then uh, a couple of the things we talked about um was uh diversify your reading 
don't go to this one spot for all your news or, mm -hmm. or uh, all your understanding of a particular topic. Uh, make it broad. And, uh, and you have uh, a news source that you go to regularly, and, and I have a couple as well. Do you want to identify yeah, yours so, real quick? Um, so pretty much every morning I check in uh, with a site called Real Clear Politics. And they do a pretty good job of posting articles gathered from various news sources across the spectrum. And so, you know, you might have an article, and often they'll put them back to back in terms of the, you know, here's a, a more sort of conservative perspective on this. And then the next article will be, here's a more liberal perspective on this. And, just, yeah. and, and even then, though, I still have to choose to go through and read Right, I I can't just like oh let's let me cherry pick the ones that most line up with my predispositions to go through and read and say okay I'm probably not going to agree with this but I should read it to challenge mm -hmm. my thinking to make sure that I've not maybe missed something or to make sure that I haven't just bought hook line and sinker into a particular perspective and 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 maybe quite frankly some of the factual information in the source that I'm more predisposed to uh, is something that is incorrect or maybe not the whole story, only part of the part of the story. Yeah. Um, uh, a similar website that I use is called All Sides, um, where they actually have a rating system for if it's uh, far right, right, center, left, or far left. Mm -hmm. um, and they will take a topic and give you three articles from three different perspectives on that. Um, if you're interested in a podcast on uh, something like this. There's a podcast that I listen to called Left, Right, and Center. Mm -hmm. And it's just what it sounds like. They bring somebody in from the left, usually from uh, the New York Times, I believe. And then they bring somebody in from the center, or the host is really the center. Uh, and then somebody on the right, usually the editor of National Review, is usually the guy on there. And then they'll bring gotcha. in an expert and interact about it. And it uh, comes out every Friday night. And so I listen to it on Saturday mornings. It's quite good. Gotcha. That's good. Uh, so in addition to diversifying uh, our sources of input, what are some other things that we can, can do to, to be better consumers of expertise and information and wisdom and knowledge? Uh, yeah, I think, I think one thing that we can do is we have a tendency in society to uh, read people in the least uh, charitable manner. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think flipping that script a little bit and doing charitable readings of people uh, having generous assumptions about people uh, as we're reading their work. Um, so I, I, I think that's that's uh, one thing we could do. Um, and then I would I would also uh, point listeners to uh, John Stuart Mills uh, has a uh, uh, a book on liberty, and the second chapter of his book on liberty is on free speech. Uh, and I mean his famous quote. I'm going to butcher it. Is um, if if one person disagrees with 99, um, the 99 do not have a have the right, or it would not be moral, essentially, to shut up the one person than uh, if the one person had the right to shut up the 99. Mm -hmm. um, and so he's, uh, it's about 7,000 words, and it'll take you 20 minutes to read. I'll link it. Um, there's a beautiful illustrated version of it. Uh, online, so I'll, I'll link that. But uh, yeah, um, uh, know that, and he has some great recommendations in there for how to interact um, as well. And he's from the 1700s, so a little bit, a little bit older. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's helpful. Well, there's a lot more we could talk about there, but we're trying to be more disciplined this yeah, week. Yeah, we're trying we? to be disciplined in our time. Yeah. <laughs> so it's time to move on to our athlete <sighs> number twelve. <laughs> let's let's run down our list here okay all right um i already don't like the first one tom brady terry bradshaw aaron Rodgers, jim kelly joe namath uh john stockton yeah the, and then you have some osu players there do you want to do you want to yeah pander absolutely um number 12 has been pretty good for the buckeyes in the last um in the last few uh I'd say last two decades. So you have Michael Jenkins, uh, an outstanding wide receiver, played, played in the NFL for, for several years, um, made some absolutely crucial catches in their um, 2002 national championship run. Uh, Dane Sonsenbacher, another wide receiver. And, of course, uh, probably the most famous recent number 12, 
Cardale Jones. XFL star, right? Yes, and uh, Buckeye legend for being a third-string quarterback who came off the bench and had one of the great runs in college football history of uh, leading Ohio State to a decisive Big Ten championship game win, a semifinal win over Alabama, and then a national championship game win over Oregon out of nowhere. Yeah, that's great. And then Denzel Ward, great cornerback from Ohio State recently. So, all right. Number 12 seems to be a pretty quarterback-heavy number here. Very quarterback-heavy, and good quarterback as well. Yeah. Um, Bradshaw was very good. Rodgers was very good. Uh, Kelly, Namath, all those guys were very good. And and we're essentially on the same page that we don't want to go with Tom Brady. No, we don't want to pick Tom Brady. Yeah, and, you know, look. If you don't like that as a listener, that's your prerogative. And we're not claiming to be experts on this, so it's just opinion. <laughs> yeah. But our criteria for choosing an athlete is whatever we want. <laughs> um, Joe Namath, I never watched Joe play, right? But um, as a New York Jets fan, uh, he was a big um, big player for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the line was that he could thread a needle from 40 yards. Um, mm-hmm. You know, that was sort of uh, what they would say about Joe. Uh, in his passing ability. Uh, Jim Kelly uh, was an excellent quarterback for the Buffalo Bills. Yeah. Uh, Aaron Rodgers, Green Bay Packers, and Terry Bradshaw, Steelers. Any any that you want to eliminate off the list? Well, we... We, we haven't talked about John Stockton. We didn't talk about John Stockton. I like John Stockton. I do. We, we've we been a little NBA heavy we, so far. We have been, yeah. Which I'm okay with. But um, so we've eliminated Tom Brady. I'm happy with eliminating um, Joe Willie Namath. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but you want to go with him because it's fine. You're a Jet. I'm a Jets, Jets fan. fan. Yep. Okay. We we can safely. How about we, we can safely eliminate Aaron Rodgers? Okay. Yes. Okay. Rodgers. Right. Um, him, him and his discount double check. I think Kim Kelly. We could safely eliminate unless you you have an objection. My only hesitation is um, Jim Kelly is has done great work outside of the football world with his foundation raising money for um, – I want to say he has uh, a, some, a, a kid with special needs. I think he's – I think that sounds right, yeah. So – but, yeah, I think probably um, – you know Terry Bradshaw, obviously four Super Bowl championships with the dynasty of the Steelers. Maybe a better analyst and personality than quarterback. Yeah, you know, he's, he's he's remained on the sports landscape as a yeah. Though I kind of view him almost like he's the William Shatner of uh, in some ways of the NFL. Like you think about William Shatner, he was known for being an actor, right? And then he kind of almost became a caricature of himself. Yeah. And that's what Terry Bradshaw, I think, has become in some ways. Like, he's he's fully bought into the, people make fun of me for this, so I'm going all in. And I'm just going to intensify my, my my characteristics that lead people there. So, all right, who do you want to go with? I mean, in one sense, the, the easy answer is to avoid all the football, all the quarterbacks, and just go with John Stockton. But... And I love John. St- I mean, he's great. I mean, a, a, top a, assist, three in yeah. assists in an NBA history, and not because he was this athletic freak. I mean, he was very ordinary athletically, oh, man. You know? But we also kind of went with, we went with Steve Nash, who was kind of in that vein. Yeah. But John Stockton was historically more significant than Steve Nash. Absolutely. Um, but we got to make a decision here. Who do you want to go with? Uh, let's go. Uh, I want to go Terry Bradshaw. Okay. Yeah, we can go with that. He's I grew up watching him on TV. Yeah. You know, watched some highlights from his old Super Bowls. Let's go TV. Okay. Terry we're Bradshaw. We're going to go Terry Bradshaw. Yeah. Didn't know we were going to go that way when no, we started the episode. No, I, I did not. Uh, not even when we started this conversation. <laughs> no. No. Yeah. All right. So what's one thing you like this week? Oh, goodness. Well, uh, I have been... For the most part, except for this, have been in self quarantine doing uh, Zoom meetings all day, and so trying to find things to occupy my time. Uh, me, uh, me, and Andrea have turned our attention to uh, a TV show on Hulu uh, called White Collar. Uh, okay. If you've never seen it before, it's about uh, a guy who gets arrested for white collar crimes, uh, forgeries, those sorts of things. Um, uh, gets brought back by the FBI to help 
track down other criminals. Okay. Humorous, light, easy watching. Uh, okay. It's been good. Nice. Nice. So speaking of humorous and light, uh, my one thing this week is going to be uh, Frank Caliendo. So Frank is um, a comedian who specializes in impersonations. And so um, on Twitter, he's been pretty consistently doing uh, primarily more sports Im- impressions. But, That's sort of his wheelhouse, yeah. But he does a great Morgan Freeman, though, too. <laughs> and so pretty on a, on a daily basis, he's kind of releasing these short videos where he's, you know, commentating things with, with his impersonations of John Madden or Morgan yeah. Freeman or Tony Romo or things like that. And so um, that, that's been my one thing. Now, a side note, there is occasional um, content that uh, may not be always suitable for uh, young, 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 young listeners. listeners. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's put it that way. So, um, I've seen him live. Have you seen him live? I did. He, he came here to Warsaw. Yeah, um, I saw him in Warsaw. We must have go. He must have come twice then, because I went with I went with Kyle Brenneman. Yeah, I went with. Uh, you took with, your boys. Didn't I went you? with Nate. Oh, Nate yeah. from Ohio. Nate from Ohio. And uh, my two boys. It was a lot of fun. Very nice. So that's that's going to be my one thing I like this week. Sweet, but so cancellation of Olympics, the death of expertise, Terry Bradshaw. I'll mark this as mission accomplished. Yeah, you? we've we've done it. Yeah, we've done it. Yeah, another another notch in the belt for the various and sundry podcast here. Um, and with Indiana's shelter in place, we we don't know what the next couple of weeks look like. Yeah. Uh, we are still going to try to record something, yes. uh, but we don't know what that looks like, and the audio quality might change uh, or. Uh, might not. Uh, we'll we'll see, but we're going to try to bring you some kind of content. We just don't know what it's going to be. We remain gonna... committed to not allowing COVID-19 to derail our podcast. We so, were on COVID early. Yes. And so uh, in, in light of that, we, we commit to you as our listeners to, to try to bring some measure of entertainment and information into your life during these troubled times. And so... Since we've accomplished what we've set out to do by covering our various and sundry uh, topics, I guess we're left with simply saying, the Lord bless y'all real good. Later. Later.